Can you hear me fine with this? Everything's okay? Great. So once again, my name is Murad Yazdani, um, and I'm a research scientist at UC San Diego. I'm also a data scientist at the Open Medicine Institute in Mountain View, um, and I do anything that's related to data science and machine learning. And today I'd like to talk about the situation where um, we use exploratory data analysis for pretty much all data science problems, um, but in particular for images and documents. And uh, so this situation you might run into uh, because you'll see that this is one of the base classes in scikit-learn. Uh, it's a transformer class and uh, the data type that it expects from your, for your fit transform method um, is this NumPy array that has to have n samples. It has a two-dimensional two array basically where you have rows and columns, right? And so most machine learning algorithms expect data structure this rows and columns kind of type of thing. Um, but there's plenty of uh, cases where that's not the type of data structure that you get, right? So these, these are the types of things that we're going to look at today. Um, images and documents, so you can have fMRI images that are volumetric, um, and you have social media images, social media networks, um, protein networks, gene, gene expression pathways, uh, the database, so this KEG database, for example, has uh, description files of, of proteins, of different types of proteins. Um, you have documents in, in, as, as, as forms of books or as forms of um, papers on, on archive, for example. And so these, there's a wide range of variety of things, right? Um, and so quite often, the thing that people do, right, is that we have to sort of engineer uh, these types of data sets into something that's machine learning friendly so we could use it in scikit-learn or any of those other popular machine learning methods. And so the basic question is, well, how do we know we've engineered these data sets in the right way so that, so that we're getting meaningful results. Um, and another related question is, so the big data, data science, machine learning, these are very popular things and a lot of organizations want to get in on it because they, they know they have a lot of data, um, but they don't quite often have labeled data. That's the, probably the best use case of machine learning is supervised learning still. Um, I've even heard people say that supervised learning is essentially a solved problem now. If you have enough data, you can pr pr pretty much get very good models. Um, but if you have, you have, if you have the constitution where let's say you're in a library and everything is, or you have a series of proteins and just, just data, well, what do you, what do you do, right? So using exploratory data analysis, we we're able to kind of explore what's in here, what's the value, and potentially find some interesting insights. Okay, so now I, I work with uh, Lev Manovich, who's actually a media uh, study, uh, intersection of media theory, art history, and computer science, and working with other people. But one reason why I like being in data science is I get to be in everyone's backyard. So I work with, I work with art historians and, and anyone that has data, I'd, I'd love to work with them, right? Um, so he has this, had this kind of vision that's, that's, that's been, actually it's a very popular idea, is that when you do kind of sort of standard data visualization practices to uh, take advantage of the case where you have image collections and do kind of more high level types of visualizations. So, um, I'll, and I'll talk about his, his theories later, but we have this, we've been working on this idea of having this image plot. Um, and so this is a series of libraries that are, are Python code that I've been working on with my colleagues, Sherry Huang and Damon Crockett, who's actually in Chicago now, um, and, and many, many others. And we have this generalization of a montage, image histogram, image scatter plots. So I'll be showing you what those are, but that's out there. And there's lots of people who are actually working on this type of stuff. Um, so I think the open source community has a huge opportunity to actually make some serious contributions here. We're just basically just sticking random stuff together and hope it works, right? Um, so I'll go over the classic EDA pipe, um, just to give, give some classic overview, and then I'll talk about the specific case for using e for collections of images, and then using PyImagePlot to kind of just visualize these features. Um, and then if we have time, there's a lot of slides actually, um, we'll also talk about uh, uh, looking at uh, documents, and the particular case study is investigating app in newspaper documents over five decades. All right, so EDA actually was coined by uh, this gentleman on Tukey, and there's this picture, just so you know what he looks like. And he has he's a mathematician; he's done a lot of great things. Um, but I really liked his this one particular quote, where you know, after all this math and all this great stuff, uh, the simple graph has brought more information to data analysis mind than any, any other device. And I think this is really true. It's also previous 
speakers where they were trying to integrate with other people, other, other teams, data scientists and software engineers were trying to collaborate. I think having this communication using the graph is a very powerful tool. Um, and one of the reasons why the graph is so powerful, I think, is this classic example um, called Anscombe's Quartet. If you haven't seen this, this is four different data sets. It's a synthetic data set, but this, this in the real world too. So it's four different data sets that has identical summary statistics, essentially. So the, these four different data sets have identical mean in X and Ys, uh, identical variances, identical um, correlations between X and Ys, and also their linear regression is practically the same for each cases, right? But when you visualize these data sets, they're completely different. They're very, very different data sets, right? So there's very different relationships here. So they, this data visualization is a very powerful tool for this reason. Because um, quite often when we make these kind of summary statistics or estimations or classification models, we're making a huge number of assumptions. And it's very easy for these assumptions to fail. All right. So EDA, this, this is a process. And I really think this is the fun of data science. So the keynote speaker was, I think, having a lot of fun. And we were really having a blast looking at exploring what is this you know, health record data set and just finding, answering different questions and having a really conversation. And a programming language like Python really gives you this power to be able to have a conversation with the data and find the value in there. So the, 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 the thing is, the, the, the two main approaches that we use is this idea of statistical modeling, which is basically running summary statistics or summarizing your data into basic counts. Um, and means and variances, and then if we could also somehow visualize the data, right? And, and the nice thing about summary statistics is that it's pretty scalable. You can write a couple of lines of code, uh, as you saw, and you can get some counts of the most, you know, the biggest violators of, of Chicago's public health laws. Um, and, and so it's, it's very, very quick and scalable. Um, but visualization, the, the uh, uh, assumptions that you have to make for, 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 for uh, running summary statistics, but the problem is that it's rather it's not it's not really scalable to to visualize every relationship every variable in, in your data right so the typical thing that we do is we usually look at a couple of variables in our scatter plots or histograms or or box plots right if you have let's say if you're just looking at scatter plots and you have five variables well that's basically ten plots for you to look at you just look at every little every, every pair right if you have six variables you have fifteen plots and anything after that really is just not really scalable for us to comprehend. So that, that becomes an issue. And the classic thing to do when you have lots of high dimensional data is to use this manifold learning or understanding what is the lower dimensional structure of the data, right? And so scikit-learn has a number of uh, uh, dimensionality, dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA, principal component analysis, that I'm going to talk about, about a lot. Um, there's also multidimensional scaling for uh, uh, if, if you if you want to non non metric multi dimensional scaling is especially interesting and it's used it a lot um, and then of course a more recent met met uh, method is the uh, Tisney uh, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding that's 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 shown very very promising results for visualizing high dimensional data sets so I'm not going to talk about the, te the technical details of of these methods but just kind of apply them and and, and see what we get <clears throat> so all these things and 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 everything we talked about was for this classic kind of structured data situation, right? So what if you just have um, uh, a, a bunch of images or documents or audio, right? So in that case, like I said, we were forced to engineer some sort of features, right? Figure out how do we represent these data sets into rows and columns. And this feature engineering is, is of course, a huge topic. And there's actually two Wikipedia articles about it. There's this idea of feature engineering and feature learning and uh, the, the main distinction is that feature engineering is when you're using some sort of domain knowledge or some sort of, ex, some sort of expertise or prior knowledge, um, and, and you're manually trying to figure out, well, what are those inter interesting features for me to code? Whereas in feature learning, you'd like an algorithm that tries to find relevant features, right? And so in the case of, for example, deep learning, when you're solving uh, supervised learning, then feature learning is, has been shown to be a very, very effective method. But still, you want to know, well, if the features I've learned or the features I've engineered are they any good? Is there any value in there, right? Um, and so EDA, I think, can be used as a, this is a very general pipeline that, that, that we should apply, right? Is when we have this data set, we have, or, or just collection of data, right? In some database or just in your directory somewhere, you extract these features into, 
into a nice, neat, structured data set, and then somehow visualize it and to validate if these features were good and also figure out well, what's in your data. Right? So this is the general pipeline. Okay. Now for, for visualizing these features, the classic thing to do is look at the right. So if you if you extract features and it's a high dimensional uh, vector space, then you do PCA or TISNY on, on this high dimensional vector space and you and you draw a scatter plot, right? So the idea here is if you have images, instead of put uh, instead of doing the scatter plot, you, you instead of having the, the, the dots, you actually put an actual image there, right? Of what, what that image corresponds to. So this is actually my axis here interpretable. This is the open food data set from a uh, Kaggle. If you, if you go to Kaggle, they have a bunch of data sets and they have this really neat data set that's open food. And if you, I just plotted the relationship of food that has a, uh, between um, protein and carbon footprint, right? So you can see there's this sort of li linear relationship between uh, carbon footprint and protein. So the more beef heavy your diets are, then the more carbon footprint it tends to have. And that's that's popular in press and it's, it's, been, it's been talked about, right? But food item. So if we put the, the actual image there, you'll notice that some of these outliers are actually not beef. They're chocolate brand. And if you actually look at all these kind of little outliers that print, seen that. So that's already something really fishy there, right? Like why would chocolate that's, that has very zero beef, essentially, um, very um, um, have, have, have such high carbon footprint. So this either suggests that this particular company or this particular brand has, has a practice that is particularly bad or there's something wrong with this data, right? So uh, if you're interested in, in, in this kind of thing, there's an, I, I wrote, wrote a little LinkedIn article about it on, so just look this up and, and then you can read more and, and stuff. So, so, you, so I'm, I'm, I try to visualize these types of things using a set of code that me and my colleagues have, have worked on um, and, and like I said, there's lots of opportunity here to make this way better than what it is, right? So this is like just version 0, 0, .0 minus 1 or something, right? Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll show a couple of case, use cases now. So um, here, let's look at images from Twitter, right? So I think a lot of people here use Twitter. Uh, Pi Data Chicago uses Twitter, I've noticed. Um, and, and, and so there's people tweet images and, 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 and they, they, they write text and all this sort of stuff. And so there's actually a lot of a large body of research that shows that the different types of things that people tweeted about, their, their sentiments and the different types of content tends to reveal something about the socioeconomic characteristics of that particular location. Right? So in other words, you can actually kind of predict what the socioeconomic status of a, of a city or a neighborhood is based on the type of tweets that people tweet. So we've been kind of asking a similar question with our research is, is there anything about the images that people tweet that also reveal something about that location or that space? And so this is, there's some, some works there for you to check out if you're, in, if you're interested. Um, so if you just look at a, a montage visualization of the images, and if you use Twitter, like I use Twitter and I just mostly tweet about data stuff and I, make, I, I tweet a graph or something, and I, you would think that there should be nothing really interesting there, right? Um, and sure enough, if you just look at this collection of images, this is just 10,000 um, uh, images randomly sampled from, I said not even 10, this is not even 10,000, this is less than that, but this is just some small sample of images from downtown San Diego, um, and, and, and there's really not, not much structure there, right? But if we actually organize these images um, um, by the hour of the week and the day of the week that it was posted, so this is, each of, this is actually a histogram, and each of these little... Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Joe will have to switch mics. Okay, sure. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we'll have to switch mics. There's yes. a, a problem with that uh, lapel mic. Uh, also, while we're switching, the, uh, the speaker in the other room has shown back up. So this is a fascinating talk, and you should stay. But if you wanted to see the other speaker, yeah. um, the other speaker is here. Yeah, yeah turn that off, and uh, just make sure to try to get that. Speak, just directly. speak into this. Nice. Cool. Sure, yeah, perfect. Oh, perfect, fantastic, okay. All right, well, okay. Any questions? Make sense so far? Okay, I mean, this is basic, very basic, but I think, I think kind of powerful because now instead of visualizing these images as just a, a random collection, we're organizing by the date that it was, or, or time that it was posted, right? So each of these, so we, you can't actually zoom in here because this is a very low res image, but we have high res images. Um, offline. 
um, that you can zoom in. And there is this very particular structure here, right? So you can see that in San Diego, and uh, uh, pe people really love using Twitter in the in, in Friday evening and Saturday evening, and then it kind of goes down, right? Um, and there's there tends to be two humps here corresponding to a lunch and, and, and dinner time, right? Um, and 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 we've also each of these bins we we we've, we've we've organized the images by by the average hue, so you can see kind of like these um, interesting mostly white images are, are are clustered in the bottom, right? Okay, so that's that's San Diego. But what if what we, what we want to know was are other cities different or, or, or are they the same? So we compared, like say, for example, to Philadelphia, and we also have Chicago, I didn't put it here, but, but we can look at it here later if, you, if you're interested. Um, so you can see Chicago, Philadelphia has a very, very different pattern, right? And this is, again, both of them are 10,000 samples. You're seeing 10,000 images from Philadelphia and 10,000 images from San Diego. And we're just organizing it by the time that it was posted, right? And so you can see that there's actually, that the tweeted images have a very unique spatial temporal component. Without and I used no mathematical model here. Right? I just I just I just plotted stuff, and then, then that's what you see. Um, and then furthermore, because we're plotting the actual image, you can see that the content that, that people in Philadelphia are sharing is also different. You'll see that at the bottom, there's kind of these there's significantly more images that have kind of this white background, right? And so in the next slide, I'm actually zooming into this kind of component, and you can see that in Philadelphia, people love to share these types of images that. I don't. I don't even. I don't even know what to call them. But, 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 uh, but yeah. This is. 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 This is what pops out, right? Um, um, so. So again, I use no math here, and and it's. I think. I think it's quite convincing. I could, of course, in my paper, because I mean, we're supposed to like write something, right? So. So I. I, I estimate some feature. I, I do this, and I calculate my p values, and yes, they're different, right? But. 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 But I think. I think. I think this is. This is far more convincing than some p-value that's like one time sent and they get 11 or something, right? Like this is, I think, far more convincing. Um, so uh, we, all have, we have a similar project that looks at selfies from five different uh, cities, from five different global cities, from Instagram. And, um, and actually, really, this was, um, the Im image histogram was inspired by Moritz Stefaner, our, our, our collaborator, who's a, 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 a brilliant data visualization experts, and he has an amazing podcast on, on data visualization that you should check, check out. Um, and so if you go to selfiecity.net, uh, you can actually explore these data sets and it's interactive. But I wanted the Python kind of implementation that lets you explore these images. This was sort of like a one-time kind of thing. Um, at least at the time it was. Um, okay, so, so go, go kind of reviewing again, so we had a collection of images, we extract some features, and then we visualize it, right? So in the previous case, the features are just basically metadata, right? It's just the time that it was posted, and maybe average hue, so that's just some color histogram, right? So that's, that's our features, right? But if you have a collection of images, you really need to be using deep learning. Like, like it's, 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 it's good stuff. Like it act, it's, it's, it's really quite impressive how well it works. Um, and uh, so, so it, it's, it might sound like a trend or a, or a buzzword or something, but, but it's, it's really quite fascinating. Um, so so the, the thing is, and this is still, I think, not even, it's, it's been known for a couple of years now, at least, but it's still not wildly, no, known wildly enough, I think. And that's that these deep networks that you're learning, they're, it's, they're hierarchical and they're layering features upon features upon features. And of course, at the last layer, there's this classification layer that should do your classification. But it turns out, these hierarchical features that you're learning, they're, they're actually very useful, and they can be used for other tasks. And if you, I think, you know, maybe 10 years ago, if you took a machine learning class or something, they would, they would say that, okay, if you build your model based on the data, that model is only relevant for, that, for the statistical assumptions on that data set. If you move that model to a different data set, there's no guarantee that you would, you would get anything meaningful, right? But in the case of, uh, deep learning, we've used this for art images, we've used them on satellite images, we've used them on, um, uh, on, on, on shoes, on, on very, very different types of images um, that have very different statistical characteristics than the image in that data set, that's this controlled data set, and we're getting very, very impressive results, right? So all we're doing is basically we're extracting features from these pre-trained neural networks that were trained on ImageNet, essentially. Um, and, and using it for our applications, right? And, and, and it's giving us quite phenomenal results. Um, so uh, you, can, you should download CAFE. It's very difficult to get it set up. I, I had to get a lot of help to get, to get it set up on, on our uh, machines, but, but, but we, have, we have great help. And so, so they set, set up CAFE for us. Um, and CAFE, well, the reason 
we like it at, at, at the time when we started this 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 work was that that was the um, the library that had a bunch of pre-trained networks available from this so-called model zoo GitHub repo that that they have a they have a, um, a, a repository of all different types of uh, pre-trained networks. Similarly, there is another project called Deep Detect that has a bunch of networks that have been trained on different types of data sets. So essentially, you can download these um, networks for free and then extract the features from them and, and visualize your image collections. Okay. Um, so uh, we've, we've, we've seen a couple of presentations on uh, writing pipelines so that they're, they're scikit-learn friendly because scikit-learn has this amazing pipeline and this amazing um, uh, uh, API. So I was doing a lot of kind of feature extraction. I was using this cafe library a lot and I used scikit-learn a lot. So I made something called Ski Cafe, right? Um, just, just for myself, but then it's funny because you write something for yourself and then other people start using it too and it's like, okay, I guess this is kind of a thing now. Um, and when I say other people, I mean like three other people. So like, it's not, it's nice, but, but, but yeah. So, um, so it's essentially this is, this is, and I think, I think there's been some talks about this already that you can, you can uh, write your own wrapper, that your, your own estimator, your own classifier using scikit-learn's amazing API. And now you can kind of integrate uh, this with, with other, your, your standard machine learning pipe, pipe pipeline. All right. So, so the, the, the basic thing that, that you do is you first, um, using the o OS module, I, I didn't do, do my correct, so I'm not showing my import section, sorry, that's, that's probably crucial. Um, but, but, but essentially, um, you just, in, in, in the work case that I have, and I think a lot of people have, uh, you have a collection of images lying somewhere in some directory somewhere, and then you just load all the images. Um, uh, you just essentially recursively walk through this, your source path, um, and then you just you just check to see if it's within your image if it's one of these image types, right? Um, and then so Ski Cafe, what what I what I what I do there is I just I have to specify where is Cafe located, and then I um, uh, specify the uh, uh, the the more, essentially the model architecture. This is the model architecture file, so this is a ResNet architecture, and then uh, and then the, the train parameters of that model. So you have these two files that you download from from the Berkeley uh, model zoo. And then you, you kind of pass this into Ski Cafe, um, and that gives you essentially a deep learning model, right? Um, really a, a feature extractor, so it's really like a, just an estimator. And so you do your, your fit, which in this case is just loading the parameter networks. Um, and, then, and then you transform your features, again, which is a list of image paths, into a, uh, to, into a NumPy array. Or op optionally, I have a flag that lets you output into a pandas data frame. Right? So, so essentially, you give it a list of um, image paths, and then you get a NumPy array out. That's now your structured data, and now you can do machine learning. Okay, so let's let's let me sh let me show an example of that now. So, so we have this. Uh, there's this. <clears throat> there are many many base stations in San Diego that collect data because we have a wildfire problem. We also have you know we have a drought problem. We have we have a lot of problems, but it's a great city. Um, and and so the the wonderful thing is we have um, these uh, 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 base stations that, that collect temperature. Uh, um, uh, uh, pressure, all sorts of things, and also there's a camera that takes an image every minute. And so we have this kind of awesome data set that's just images every minute. It's a time lapse, right? Right? Photography or video. Um, and so this is like one particular scene where an, an image is, is being taken every day, right? So you have all these images just lying in your hard, hard drive. Well, what do, you, what do you do with it, right? So if you just apply this kind of pipeline where you just load the images, extract these features, and then do do a basic PCA and see what you get. So this is kind of what you get for, from one day. This is one day of data. Um, and this is the PCA we get. But of course, instead of putting dots, we're putting the actual image that was, that was posted there, right? Um, and and if, so we, if you have like a big monitor and, and stuff, then you can zoom in and it's really fun. But, but here, just, just you know, bear with me with this low res image, right? So you can see kind of there's like these two nice clusters. Uh, this is basically all the nighttime photographs that that's just they're all, they're all clustered well together and then this is a kind of the evening photograph and i think here i just show like a kind of a zoomed in version of it um and so you can see this is just that same uh photograph that i showed here right so that's like the um middle of the day kind of kind of thing right so that's july 1st and you see there's basically two modes right there's nighttime and then there's like mostly daytime and then tr a transition between these two modes um so that makes sense, and I think this is a reasonable feature. You go to July 2nd, again, you get something pretty reasonable, so this suggests that it's 
uh, robust to different days. And remember, different days have different weather conditions and there's clouds and different things. And it's, there's still primarily two modes, right? Slightly different, but because there's different kind of stuff, right? There's clouds and, and everything. So it's not, it shouldn't be exactly the same, but it's pretty much the same. And then if you go to July 3rd, it's totally different, right? So, so, so what happened on July 3rd? And if we kind of zoom in here, you see that there was actually a fire on July 3rd. And so, so we have no label data, we have nothing, and, 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 but, but, but just by visualizing this data, it's very, very clear that the distribution and the temporal aspects of this, these features change a lot based on this crazy event that happens, right? Fortunately, the firefighters came in very early and you know, nothing bad happened, but, but we got cool data. So. And of course, I have to just pay respect that these, this idea of visualizing images in this way is not new. And it goes back to, uh, I think the earliest example I could find was Francis Galton, the scientist, and I have to put his picture because you know, it's important, I guess. Um, and uh, and it's a half cousin of Darwin, right? Kind of interesting. And so he, he did a lot of stuff, um, some bad stuff too. Um, but but uh, his interesting work here, he was like some eugenics guy, I don't know. So kind of kind of weird stuff. Um, but um, he, so this is England and he's, he's, he's plotting the actual wind direction and, and currents um, as, as a kind of little figure on top of England to visualize how that looks like, right? how the distribution of different winds and currents look like. Um, so, so again, no idea is really original. It goes back to many, many years. So this is certainly, there's nothing new ha happening here. That's all I want to say. Okay, so here now I'm going to switch gears to looking at collections of documents. So that was images. Uh, for Im the, but, but the pipeline is essentially the same. You load your files and you extract some sort of feature and then you visualize it with PCA or some dimensionality reduction technique. Right? So in, um, uh, uh, for, in the case of documents, the most popular feature is, uh, one of the most popular features is this term frequency feature that is essentially um, uh, uh, counts the number of words that, that occur in each document. And, and so you get this one long feature vector that's, 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 that, that depends on the number of words in your vocabulary. So you could visualize each of these documents with the word cloud, but there are a lot of data viz experts who hate word clouds. Um, I don't feel so strongly about it, um, but yeah, I mean, it, you just, I, think, I think you have to be careful who your audience is. Um, so I didn't want to risk anything. I'm not showing any word clouds. So there we go. Um, <clears throat> And, and, but then the, 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 perhaps a more meaningful text feature is the problem with this set sort of features is if you have a common words like stop words such as the or and or that maybe are not interesting, they, they, they tend to appear superficially important, right? So we'd like to somehow normalize these words to be less important. And so this term frequency, inverse document frequency um, feature is very uh, popular. So it's essentially we're taking the term counts that we had and we normalize it by this um, uh, by this by this weight. That's essentially the how often the word occurs in other documents, right? So the occurs in a lot of documents, and we want to bring its weight down. And that's what this term essentially does here. Okay. Um, so here, uh, the case study that we're looking at is, is is newspapers in UC San Diego. So I think uh, someone during the rant, I don't know if they're here, but. Uh, they said, I think, and I think uh, uh, they worked in the library sciences, um, uh, defended the, the scientists who don't share the data um, because, because of copyright issues. Uh, so, so that's definitely a big, big issue. But, but what's, what's amazing is actually a lot of data that's, that has no copyright. And, 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 so, and libraries are actually digitizing these data sets and making it available for research or, or whatever we want to do with it, right? Um, so, for example, UC San Diego, it's a pretty new school, a relatively new school, um, but they, they've had this, uh, you know, student newspapers. There's like two, two versions of them. There's this UCSD Guardian, that's like the official uh, campus paper that gets funding from the university or, or it has like, you know, it's like a very official thing. Um, and, and then there's like independent things that people do on their own, like a, like a zine or a zine, and, and it's about you know, kind of just random stuff. Um, uh, but, 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 the, but, but so, so we have this data set and um, that's been digitized and I think every library has a data set. I had no idea that, they, that libraries actually did this. So I, I thought, well, we have like, we have text, we have, and they, they also record um, music. So we have, I think, 40 years of audio recordings with the scores that the performers have recorded. So that's, that's, that's a lot of um, interesting uh, data, data applications we've made there. 
Um, so check out your local library. There could be some cool data sets, not just books. Um, and so what was great about working on this project is I was working with a humanist, Erin Glass, who's a, who's, a, who's a humanist, and uh, she kind of wanted to investigate this data. And my intuition as a machine learning guy is, well, okay, I should use this because like, it has like equations and math and like it's in scikit-learn, so I should like use it, right? Because it's, 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 it's machine learning. But then when you work with someone who's a domain expert and has a, has a different perspective, you get just very refreshing questions. So she, had, she just posed this very interesting um, question that was like, well, what is the term frequency between the gendered pronouns, right? What is, is there a difference between the number of times the word he was used and the number of times the word she was used? And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it, you would think that it shouldn't be that different. Um, and it's a pretty easy regex thing. So I, I should, you know, yeah, it's like, we should, we should do this. Like we, should, we should see if, if, if there is a relationship between the he count and the she count. And then I came up with this amazing equation, uh, which is just... Uh, uh, the, the, this, the he count versus the she count, but then I have a Laplacian scaling, right? So, to, to, um, so you don't have to divide by zero, right? That's, that's all I do. Um, and and it's essentially all, all we're doing is that um, for each issue, we count the number of he's and we count the number of she's, and we have a different corpus, right? We have a, the official UCSD Guardian newspaper, and then we have the official UCSD student newspapers, or, or, or unofficial, I should say, student newspapers. Um, and we want to know, is there a difference between these counts, the ratios for these two different corpora, right? And how do these ratios change over time? That's, that's the basic question. So you just you're, do your regex, um, and you get a plot like this. <clears throat> and um, so this is he over she. Um, so equality would be if we were at one. And you can see that in the early uh, 60s, mid-60s, uh, he outcounts she by order of you know, order of magnitude, um, and it, it tends to go down. And these, these are actually averaged over the year. So, that, so there's the data is, I couldn't fit everything into one kind of uh, slide here, but um, essentially it, he's always out, outnumbering she by like at least a factor of two, even, even, even out here it's, it's out, outnumbering by a factor of two. Um, but if you study the data a little closer, there is kind of these like, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. And, and um, so and, and it seems that to be a, a, a seasonal component to it every every four years or, or some or so, which is a kind of a funny number because it corresponds to either presidential elections or um, or different student bodies coming in and out, um, and and so 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 what's what's clear though is that there's there's a very wide gender gap that has that has persisted. Um, now what we want to know is what about other newspapers across the country, right? other 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 university. Uh, student newspapers. Are, are there more ones that are more perhaps um, uh, diverse or equal, or what, what is what is driving this? Um, and the other thing that would be interesting, I think, is that um, <clears throat> so quite often I think uh, these these articles we looked at them a little bit. They 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 tend to be talking about men, right? So that's why they use the word he. It makes sense, right? Um, but but I think this year is very interesting. We only have up to, up to twenty fourteen, but hopefully we'll get more. This this is the first time where a woman is running for president, right? So it'd be really interesting to see if it would actually be a more equality or, or, or a significant shift. So it remains to be seen, but, but, but it's, it's a very interesting year, I think. Um, <clears throat> so then, of course, I, I have to try my TF-IDF stuff, right? Because it's like, I got to do something. So, um, so I extract the TF-IDF and, and again, do, do the PCA to see if there's any valuable or interesting signal here. And so this is this is kind of what we get. This to each of these dots, and these are all interact. These are plot lead plots, so they're, they're interactive. Um, and so we, this is what what the distribution of the, of the issues looks like for student newspapers, and this is what the distribution of issues looks like for the UCSD Guardian. And I've color coded it based on the decade that it was published. Right, each of these issues are published. And with with the student newspapers, you don't see quite as a strong. A temporal components, but with the UCS Guardian, there's a very, very strong temporal component, right? So, like the there's 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 a radical shift between essentially topics or word distributions uh, throughout different decades. Um, so, of course, now we have to investigate what are the words that are driving the changes. Is it is this noise? What are we observing here? Um, but at a high level, we this is we're already forming these hypotheses. Uh, and and humanists can investigate kind of interesting outlier years. Like, like so, for example, if you go back here, right? Like in this particular year, there was a huge like outlier. Like, what, why is that year an outlier? Um, why is this year an outlier? 
and, and so, so we can focus our attention on particular key points. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost, I'm pretty much done. Uh, what, I, what we discussed was a basic EDA pipeline that I think should be the first thing and probably the, the first thing you do every day when you have a, have a new data. So just to review your assumptions um, and then create these plots uh, and share it with your team. And, every, and your team quite often has different backgrounds, uh, but everyone understands plots. So it's, it's very important. Um, and we talked about visualizing collections of images um, and looking at some documents. All right, so I'd like to thank my colleagues, Sherry Huang, uh, Damon Crockett, Lev Manovich, Jay Chow, uh, Larry Smar, and uh, also uh, the Institute for Pure and Applied Math at UCLA for uh, uh, partially supporting this. Um, and thank you. I'll take questions. Oh, um, so the question is how computationally intensive is it to produce the image plots? Uh, so if you're looking at the order of 10,000 or so images, not very, it's, 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 not, it's not an issue at all. Um, and I think, so if you go into like the millions, which we have done, that could, that, 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 I mean, that takes, well, we still run everything on a laptop. So it's, it's essentially, we definitely, definitely, definitely scale things. Um, but even if you do a million, or if you show a plot of an image plot of a million points versus like, let's say 100,000 points, the human eye can't really tell the difference. So at, 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 at some point, it doesn't even really matter. So you, you have to, you're forced to take a sample of, 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 of your data. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs>